greater than you could ever need. He's more than the eye could see. I don't deserve his love, but he's always been there for me. You see, Jesus met me when I was at my lowest. And if you don't know Jesus, know this. He is the greatest example of generosity this world of greed has ever seen. And when Jesus hit the scene, he changed the scenery and met diversity with serenity. If you're looking for peace, he offers plenty. Jesus was and Jesus will forever be king. And when the angels sing, they sing of the grace that was displayed for sinners like me. I can't explain him and I can't describe him. And if I could, he wouldn't be Jesus. Because you can't explain eternity and you can't comprehend the galaxies. But it was the loving hands of Jesus who sprang into existence and created man knowing he would go to the cross to pay our sentence. There was a certificate of judgment with a period after the sentence and we were sentenced to death long before he said it is finished. He is a father to the orphan, a shelter for the homeless, a hiding place for the abused, and an anchor for our storms. He stormed the gates of hell and came out on top and the power of his gospel cannot be stopped. Even when the world tries, they try a lot. He traded places with Barabbas and became the catalyst of missions across the world covering every portion of the atlas. If you're in need of rest, I know of a mattress. If you don't know Jesus, your future is tragic. But he gladly embraced tragedy so we could live in his presence of majesty. His presence is presence. And it's his presence that presents preciousness to a world of peasants. He is far from pretentious but still loves those who are. He is alive the world and hung the stars. He brings the dead to life and delivers life to the dead. He took a crown of thorns on his head so we could put crowns at his feet. And I can't wait until I get to kiss his feet that were nailed to a cross for me and for you and for every person around the world. He loves the world and I love his word because the word became flesh and in his flesh he demonstrated the word to the world. He is an example to every boy and every girl. He is a lover of black people. He is a lover of white people. He is a lover of the unchurched and the assembly under the steeple. He doesn't see the believers' failures, but still takes time to celebrate their faithfulness. It's the power of the Spirit that enables us and gives us boldness when the world labels us. And if you want to label me, please call me a Jesus freak. Amen. That freaks you out good. Because it's better to be good with God than to fight being misunderstood by a world that could never understand. So let it be understood that I don't worship man. We worship Jesus. Though he doesn't need us, he still sees us and pleads with us to run to the cross where he bled for us. His heart bleeds for us. His heart grieves for us. But still graciously grants us a pardon for our treason in a season where the world tries to explain the way the work of the spirit with human reasoning. There is a reason they can't. Because the spirit is like the wind and the wind cannot be seen. But loved is the one who believes without seeing the unseen. I'm telling you today that Jesus is something. He's something more. He's something great, and if you want to know him, you don't have to wait. He stands at the narrow path with the key to the gate, and you only have to reach out and embrace his grace. I don't care who's president. I have a king who is always present. I don't care who holds musical celebrity. The voice of the Lord will always be the sweetest mother. I don't care who owns the riches of the globe. My Jesus holds more wealth than one ruby on his robe. I don't care who is the strongest or the fastest. Nothing matches the creator of the universe and his immortal, infinite status. I don't care about religious leaders who died and stayed dead. I'll only worship the one who conquered death and wears a crown on his head. His name is Jesus, and I'm telling you, he's something. He was faithful yesterday, and he is faithful today. I can feel his presence whenever I pray. And when the time comes for me to fade away, I'll remember the day I heard him say, My name is Jesus. Kind of hard to follow that up. <laughs> I showed Heather that video and she said, well, why don't you just get up there and say amen and finish and close it out. <laughs> Not to disappoint you guys too, I don't have nearly the enthusiasm this guy has or the energy, so you have to bear with me. Um, my name's Eric and uh, I'm happy to be here today. I'm always humbled anytime I get the opportunity to come up here and speak as uh, I sometimes have to wonder if Bill really knows who I am, who I was. And then I remember that he does and that Jesus has come into my life and changed who I was and made me a new man and so here I stand. So I want to start today by kind of just telling my story real quick. Most of you have heard it, but some may not have, so it's important that I share that because it's my story and God gave it to me. So um, I was raised in a religious home. I was raised in a, a, a home where we went to church every Sunday, and, and uh, I don't know that I ever enjoyed going to church on Sundays, but I did it because I was told to, and my family was told to. And anyhow, you get to a point where it's like you either have to decide whether this is something you believe or it's something you don't believe, and 
I never had that personal relationship with God. Uh, so as I got older, I kind of faded out. And I kept trying to come back, and I kept trying to recommit myself to this faith. Um, and it just didn't stick. It just didn't work. Um, in 2005, I had shoulder surgery. And uh, I, left that, I left that hospital with a morphine pump and more Oxycontin, Percocet, more Tab and Vicodin than you could feed an army. But they packed it all in my suitcase and sent me home with it. Uh, little did I know that was going to be the recipe for disaster for, for the next several years of my life. Um, I learned very quickly that it was a highly addictive substance. I didn't know that the pain medication was addictive, but I learned that. And over the next couple of years, I chased that. I chased to avoid uh, withdrawing, detoxing, anything like that. So it became taking prescribed medications to then taking somebody else's medications or buying them off the streets. Um, that ended up turning into a crippling heroin addiction, um, which lasted for, for quite a while longer. Somewhere along the road, um, my dad pulled me aside and said, son, I want you to pray and ask God to help you. And I flat out refused. I said, well, no, because if there is a God, he certainly doesn't want anything to do with me. But I'm not convinced that there is one in the first place, because if there was, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. I'm, I'm miserable. I'm unhappy. There's no joy in my life. If there's a God, then he's not existent to me. But a few weeks later, I decided to give it a shot. So I prayed. And uh, it was just a few days later, I ended up in the county jail twice. Um, and I was very angry. I, I was upset because this is not what my plan was. My plan was that God was going to come down and just remove the urge to use. He was going to just set me free from these withdrawals and just give me a new life. But my path was to go to jail. My path was to go to jail, and then I got put into a drug court program. So for the next 18 months, I was in an outpatient treatment. And I still didn't know God. I still didn't know that it was Him that had come in and done this. Um, until about four years ago. And God came into my life in such a real way. Um, and he led us here to Portland. Um, the, the cool thing is, in John, 1 John 4.19 it says, We love because he first loved us. So well before I ever knew him, he knew me and he loved me. This is a God who always loved me. Even through the, 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 the worst of my life and the, the worst of my sins, he still loved me. So after pursuing me, God asked me to start a Christ-centered recovery group. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. We are designed to help one another to lift up the name of God. So, if everybody who is comfortable will assist me with this. Can I have all of the addicts who come to the, to the recovery meeting or to other recovery groups, can you stand up, just kind of stand up? This is what God is doing, right? These, this is amazing. Thank you. What's amazing is we have this horrible habit of labeling one another. And this community is going through some tough times right now. We've got some home invasion stuff going on. We've got some break-ins, car break-ins, different types of things. And, it's, and I'm watching the commentary going wrong around the community, and it's, it's instantly pointing at those who are afflicted by addiction. And their solution is a 12-gauge shotgun. Um, wipe these addicts off the face of the earth. That's what the best solution would be. Look at the amount of addiction. People that are fighting addiction and in recovery today that are here worshiping Jesus. Is that not just amazing? Yeah. Is that not just amazing? We pray for each other. Some of the most spiritual conversations I've ever had in my life happen in our Sunday night recovery meetings. We share things about our lives that most people will never feel comfortable enough to share with another human being. We talk about it. Because we just have no shame. Our shame has been destroyed for many years. 
What pride we did have is long gone. Um, so now it's, it's, part of our, it's part of our healing process. We get to talk about things that are really, really deep and personal. And it's taken this group, and it's, God has grown this group from a, just a group of a few to a, a large group that come in. We pray for each other. We pray for, 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 the, for the church. There was over 30 drug addicts praying for Pastor Bill a couple weeks ago when he was sick, and I made sure he knew that. How does it feel knowing there are 30 drug addicts sitting around praying for you right now? <laughs> pretty special thing. Pretty amazing thing. Um, you know, we're, we're also blessed to have Pastor Bert. And I'm sure you guys all know Pastor Bert. Uh, just an amazing guy. He comes to our meetings every Sunday night. Every Sunday night. And, and last week he finally shared, for, you know, he, he'll pipe in from time to time, but he actually shared formally. He said, I'm Bert, and I guess you could say I'm addicted to y'all. <laughs> so, Amen. we're blessed to have a man like that that comes in and prays for our group and spends time with our group and just loves the Lord and loves each one of us and, and he really does, he prays daily for the people and that, that come to that meeting um, so I really want to just kind of focus on for a second not labeling one another but really trying to lift each other up in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 it says the human body has many parts but the many parts make up one whole body so it is with the body of Christ. Then later in the chapter, Paul says, In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. When you look at what an addict who can give his life or her life over to Jesus, the impact that that has on a community that suffers from addiction, it's amazing and it's powerful and it's incredible to watch. So the end goal for this group is that each one of us leaves having a personal relationship with Jesus. That the relationship with Jesus doesn't come from a set of walls in a, in a church service or in a recovery ministry, but it comes individual from one person to Jesus. So that leads me to the question, is Jesus enough? Is Jesus really enough? So I have, some, I have some questions and I have some, some answers. Well, according to the Bible, He is enough. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have ever, everlasting life. God sent His Son to the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. So that says Jesus is enough. Everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. In Romans 3, 22 through 25, it says, We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in His grace freely made us right in His sight. He did this through Christ when He, when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for our sin. So there's God saying, you're going to sin, you're going to fall short. I'm going to provide a way for you to come back and live with me. And that's going to be through a sacrifice that my son's going to make for you. Jesus himself said that he was enough. When he, John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So we are in, immersed with all these different opinions, all these different viewpoints, all these different ways of kind of integrating this, this way of making it a little bit more fun, a little bit more spicy, uh, a little bit easier on us. And when it comes right down to it, all we, all we, all we need is Jesus. That's it. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We can try to, to change it to help ourselves to feel better. Well, I'll believe in Jesus if, if this. And I'll believe in Jesus if that. But really what it comes down to is He already defeated sin. He already, he already gave His life for each of us. That was a gift given to each one of us. Not just for the good, but for the bad too. For the sinners like me. He died for me. So is Jesus enough? even when we're facing the impossible? I've got a story I want to share with you guys. I have a few stories, because I'm a storyteller. Uh, thankfully, these are all true stories. Uh, 
Babe, who comes to our recovery group, just a few weeks ago, she was in there and she was talking about, now, just so everybody knows, I already got permission from everybody to use their names. So I'm not breaking anonymity here. Uh, Babe shared about the fact that she had not seen her daughter in over two years. And that she was kind of in this position where she'd been told it's just not going to happen. And she asked if we would pray for her. And in fact, I got home that night and she sent a text to me saying, please pray for me that I can see my daughter. I don't think it was two days later, two days, she spent the day with her daughter and then the next Sunday as well. Amen. Now this is two years that God answered those prayers in two days. So even when we're facing the impossible, she had been told, not going to happen, and God said, I'll provide a way. Uh, is Jesus enough even when you're angry at him? When you resent him? When you get to that point where you just say, you know what, if there is a God, I kind of don't like you. So I don't want nothing to do with you. Well, he is. There's a, there's a gal here named Becky who I love from our recovery group. She's been coming since day one. And she has very vocally talked about her disgruntlement with God. And she wasn't really sure where she fit in with this whole God thing. But you know what, she comes every Sunday regardless. Because there's something there that keeps her coming. A couple weeks ago, she was really struggling. She's got some personal stuff that's been going on with some, some people she loves, and she was to the point where she said, I need prayer, but I can't ask for it because it's involving personal stuff. And my wife went into her, her prayer closet and prayed for her, and she texted Becky back, and she gave her this word that the Lord had given her, and it was just amazing to see how it unfolded. It, it was exactly what Becky had already been feeling, and now she was able to put the two things together and say, God's been talking to me and I just didn't recognize it. I didn't allow it in because of my resentment and anger. And she was able to put the walls down and now she has that freedom. So Jesus was enough when she was angry at him. Is Jesus enough when we feel like we do not deserve redemption or a second chance? Well, I'm going to tell you a story about Tony. Tony's a guy who I've come to, to just love. This guy is amazing. He was, a, he was a reckless dude. I mean, he, he, he'd done some things and hurt some people, and he'd made some choices that I'm sure he wished, wished for a long time he could go back and change, but he can't. God provided him a beautiful, healthy relationship and this adorable little child there. And when I saw him walk in with that baby, Heather looked over and said, that is redemption. Amen. And that truly is right there. I mean... To see him walking with this child who just has him whooped around his finger is just amazing. <laughs> is Jesus enough when we are broken and our lives are just falling apart? Well, most of you guys know Natasha. Some of you guys got to see her be baptized a few weeks ago. When I first met Natasha, she was in and out of recovery meetings and from time to time. She always said the right thing, but I, she didn't ever really have it inside of her. Um, <laughs> she's back to raise her hand. Um, she, she, she ran from recovery, and I, I ran into her a couple times in town, and then she ran from me. She rolled up the windows and darted off. And she was afraid I'd recognize her. Uh, she came back to recovery a few months ago, and it was about two months ago that uh, we got a 911 call in our recovery group, a 12-step call, which you know, was kind of like a 911 call for, for somebody who desperately needed help. And uh, we had her sponsor and another person call, and they didn't tell us her name. They just said, we need prayer. And so we sat there, all of us junkies, sitting around praying for this person. And the Lord worked through us, and he worked through our prayers. I think it was less than four days later, she gave her life over to Jesus. Amen. And two weeks after that, she was baptized. And she's herself referred to herself as a Jesus freak. Amen. And I love it. <laughs> Um, so yes, he's, he, Jesus is enough even when our lives are broken and, and, and our lives are falling apart. Is Jesus enough when we have been deceived? Now this is a story that's hard for me to talk about uh, because it's, it's so personal and it's, it's really hard to fathom how we got to this point. But two years ago, my wife and I adopted these two little boys. And they... Well, first of all, let me just say, they're absolutely adorable, but that was by design by God because they were so bad. 
that they had to be super cute to balance it out. Because <laughs> they are so cute, but oh, they were rough. Um, you could have held a sheet of paper up next to Heather, he wouldn't have been able to find her, but she was so pale. But Nasir came, our oldest child, who was five at the time, he came with some special needs. And he had some stuff going on, and uh, really challenging for us. Had zero connection to, to Heather. He would show affection towards me, he would say, I love you, Dad. He would say, you know, come sit on my lap, he would do these things. But he had no connection to Heather. A big reason for that is most of his trauma from his past life was from his mom. And so he had a hard time opening his heart to, to Heather. Um, so we, we started asking for prayer from uh, a, pa a, a pastor from another church and his advisor. And they were coming to our house and they were praying for us and they were praying for, for Nasir. And one day, as we're sitting there talking to them, this man uh, looks at Heather and I and he says, if you want to hear from God, Read my lips. You're supposed to give that child back. You're supposed to keep the young one and give the older one back because he's too damaged. And now this, was, this was supposed to be a man of God. This was supposed to be a man who was advising the pastor of our church that we were attending. And Heather and I adamantly rejected this. We knew that this was not the case. We had been trying for children for a long time. We knew that God had given us these kids, and this could not be from God. I was completely torn. This is a man I respected, and now I don't know what to believe. Is this man a man from God, or is he not? So I started praying. Heather started praying. We're praying, and then I'm just crying out to the Lord. I'm saying, God, I know this wasn't a mistake. These boys were not a mistake. Can you please just show us your can you just break us free from this lie? Just free us from this lie. And uh, just a few days later, I was at work and I got a phone call from Heather. And she said, she was crying. She's like, you're never going to believe what just happened. I'm like, what? She said, Nasir just came in and sat on my lap and started playing with my hair. And he said, I love you, Mom. Now, this is the first time he had said, I love you on his own to, to Heather. And it hasn't stopped since. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter what your faith is. There will still be times when you are challenged with finding out what is real and what is not. And that's where Jesus comes in. Jesus proved that he was enough. He was enough. We didn't need this guy for anything. We had the Lord answering our prayers. Thankfully, uh, thankfully we never, we never steer from God's uh, direction and His answer. God uses all things for His good, even when they are, even when they are meant for evil, God uses them for good. Because if there's one thing that came from that story, it was the power of prayer. And seeing God perform a modern day miracle in such a short time is something that I will never be able to deny. Heather will never be able to deny that. Even when we're challenged and life gets difficult, we'll always have those things like that to reflect on and to encourage us and to build our faith back. The last thing I want to talk about is the parable of the lost sheep. So, Jesus is constantly pursuing us. He's constantly pursuing us. He never stops. The parable of the lost sheep is actually a parable that Jesus shares. There's, it's actually shared twice in the Bible. Must be fairly important, right? Well, the, the, the general gist of it is, a shepherd has 100 sheep, and one goes missing. He should leave the 99 sheep to go find the one that is lost. Because there is more glory and happiness in finding the one sheep that is lost than there is in just retaining the 99 and forgetting the one who's lost. So I'm going to share one last story and then I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up. There's a young man who I've built a relationship with over the last couple of months. The Lord is doing his best to make sure he understands he is loved. 
that God's love is greater than anything else around us. He's been told that he's not worthy of people's love. He's been told by people from religious areas that, well, you're just not worth it anymore. And I promise you, we are all worth it to Jesus. We are all worth it. No matter what our sins are, no matter what our mistakes are, we all have, we all have redemption inside. We all have God's grace to lean on, and we all have a Lord and Savior who loves us unconditionally. I'm grateful for the for the, the fact that the Lord has used me to reach out to this young man because I've built a bond with him. Um, I've learned to love him. And it's not because I did it. Because I'm kind of selfish. I don't really like to give up my time and to do things like that. But God puts it on my heart. I can't I can't deny it, so I just run with it, and I get to spend time, and I get to see this, this young man who is hurting, and he's wanting free so bad from the grips of addiction. And I was there just eight years ago, crying out. My life was in shambles. I don't remember the last time I smiled. I would go to my home, and my family would move out of the room, move all their purses and their stuff, and I'd walk into another room and people would turn and walk out because they didn't want to be around me. Do you know how miserable that feeling is? God never left me. And thankfully I was, I was set free from that addiction. And guys, I just pray that each one of us as we go on our daily walks through life, that we pray for one another. There's something really powerful in praying for one another. I have a hard time praying for myself because I feel, you know, I still battle that self-worth thing that comes from years of addiction. But I love to pray for other people because I know that God will answer those prayers. And I get to see people like Natasha give their life to Jesus. I get to see, I get to baptize Chris. I get to see people walk in. I get to see Babe hold her daughter. I get to see Marlene get her kids back. I get to see Tony holding the beautiful baby. I get to see Becky come in and and to feel that relief. I get to see my wife interacting with, with, the, with the women from recovery and, and praying for them and being with them. God is moving right here in this community. Don't be afraid and don't let fear drive us from what our goal is, and that is everyone to have a relationship with Jesus. So before I end, I want to share something. I need to have... Uh, I hate to do this, I really do, because I know I'm going to get in trouble, but I need, I need to have Grace and Lily come on up. And we'll get an escort if I need. Come on up. Come on up. <laughs> I, you know, the only reason I hate doing this is because she's wearing a Yankee shirt. I don't want to give any, you know, credibility to the Yankees. Um, for the last year and a half, the one thing that has made our recovery group unique from, from others, besides the fact that we're Jesus freaks, <laughs> is that we've had two amazing young women dedicating their time to come watch children so that people with, that, were, that were single moms or they didn't have sitters could come and, and learn about the Lord and learn about recovery. <laughs> These guys have been given their time for the last year and a half. And everybody's been yeah. Now, sadly, this has all got to come to an end. All good things must come to an end, I guess. Um, they have now grown up and taken on full-time gigs, so they won't be able to help us out on Sundays anymore. That being said, if the Lord calls you to be involved in this so that we can continue to offer daycare, please, my number's in here, give me a call, shoot me a text, let me know if it's something you think you could do. I'd love to get a couple people that could rotate or not. I don't want anybody to feel like it's not appreciating because it is. So, I wish we could do more, but this is what we have for you today. We've got a couple of gift cards for these two. Yeah. For your time. So to end, the answer to all those questions is absolutely without any hesitation at all. 
Jesus is in heaven. And he will be here with us even at our weakest points. We all have a story to share. And I can't wait to hear a lot more of yours. Don't, be, don't hide behind them. Make sure people are, are aware that you are broken. It's okay. We all are broken. Let the Lord come in and change your heart. Thank you guys so much for your time.